<laughs> Praise ye the Lord, his mercy endures forever. I wanted to share this moment that's special to me, that's peculiarly and particularly important to me in a very intimate way. Today, what's happened is that we have presented School of the Bible after an initial start on February 2nd, as we had talked about doing 30 classes. The story behind the story is that we originally wanted to present to people at large, to the community, to everyone that would watch or that would listen or learn, a better way, a more excellent way of studying that any time, anywhere, any place, any way they chose to do, they could learn on their own and they could study to show themselves approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I personally never had a chance to go to Calvary Chapel Bible College. When originally Calvary Chapel got started in the early days, there was no Bible school. The closest that we had to it was the home pastor's class, and I listened to all those tapes, and I remember that. That was kind of interesting. And then we had, at another time, on Wednesday nights, we would have the School of the Bible, you know, the Wednesday night Bible school. And I remember going to class with Romaine, and my mother went to Malcolm Wilde's evangelism class. I went to a Jewish class taught by a woman to men. Yes, Calvary Chapel had a woman teacher teaching men. And, you know, in those days it caused a controversy, and Chuck wasn't above doing controversies at different times. But she taught Matthew, and it was one of the most enlightening and exciting times, even though I remember all the gossip that was going on at the same time. But going to that, there was always that in the back of my mind. I wanted to go to the new, you know, the teachers had been, the teachers center had been bought or whatever it was to become the uh, eventual, I guess the, it was the, the PTA meeting or something. I can't remember. But the point being is that I went up to a college and career and high school joined together um, retreat. And it was the only time I ever got a chance to go to that facility. And I spent all my time in the library. That's typical of me because later on I spent all my time in another library that I got from Firefighters for Christ and began a ministry in Klamath Falls, Oregon that went on with my mother and then on from my mother to my sister and continues to this day, 40 years later. Now, I say all this in looking back because, see, I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to be rejected, to be like Paul, the object of derision or placed and pushed aside. You see, when I went to Calvary Chapel at Costa Mesa, I sat inside the sanctuary. Nobody talked to me. Nobody came close to me. Everybody was distant, even though I was amazed at, you know, where I was at. I was in the center of the Jesus movement. It was like the heartbeat of Christianity, or it felt like it. And it was amazing to me, you know, being there. And I got involved in going seven days a week, but I went for over a month seven days a week, and no one ever talked to me until one day, one man, one kid came up and said, hey, I've seen you here, you know, um, who are you? You know, and I said, well, I'm nobody special. And I've used that many times in my life to tell people, hey, I'm nobody special, and I'm really not. I may have an intellect or an IQ or an intelligence that maybe rivals some, maybe not, but really what makes me unique and distinctive isn't what I am in my flesh, but what God has done by His Spirit. You see, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. And any man, anywhere, any place and time, God can use in any way he chooses to use them. That can mean in a capacity as a pastor, or a teacher, or an apostle, or a prophet, or a deacon, or an elder, or a church secretary, or a sound man, or a worship leader, or a singer, or a musician. And matter of fact, I think I've done all those. <laughs> With 40 years, I had plenty of time to experiment, so I got into everything at all these different Calvaries along the way. As a matter of fact, there are some Calvaries that are carnal that, you know, they'd say, well, you don't do sound very good. I'm like, well, you know what, dude, you know, <laughs> I got news for you, you know, I'm keeping my mouth shut, but, you know, I'll take all the blood and you can blame me. You know, and I mean, I laugh at that because it's like, oh, I did my time at Big Calvary. And I paid my dues over the years, going through what I'm sharing with you today about the greatest achievement of my life. You see, 
I know what it was like in those days, because in those days, I wanted more and I got less. Nobody ever visited me in hospitals when I was suffering and dying from Crohn's disease. Nobody ever came and spent time with me from Calvary or anything else. I, as a matter of fact, spent most of my time alone with God. And God wanted it that way. So looking back, it was meant to be so that today, 40 years later, pretty much, or 41 almost, today could be accomplished the greatest achievement in my life. The greatest effort that I could present to God as a living sacrifice. That I could say, here God, thank you. You've allowed me the privilege, as I say about my wife, but the same thing is true. You've allowed me the privilege to work with my own hands, to do it the way you've inspired me to do, and then to change it and make it so that you could breathe life into it and cause your spirit to work through. And that's what's happened with School of the Bible. You see, School of the Bible started in protest, just like much of Christianity is a protest. The Protestant movement is a protest against the Catholic Church and those things that they saw that were wrong. Most of my life, I've seen things that are wrong and protest. I say, you know, God, ah, you know, and looked at it and said, Ick, you know, ooey, gooey, you know, fooey, you know, and it's because it's screwy, you know, and that's why I, I protest a lot of things, you know, and over the years, I learned that I couldn't just protest, but the only way that I could contest that with which I protested is if I had something to offer instead of that with which I saw that was in error. In other words, it's easy to tear something down, but it's a lot harder to build something up or to build something. So I've always supported Calvary chapels or any church, anywhere, any place, any time, that God is using according to the measure of faith that that person has because they probably are learning the hard way. Maybe the easy way, maybe the hard way. But they're learning one way or another. And so I haven't faulted them in their egos on some things with pastors or sometimes with ministers. And I haven't faulted them on things that they are doing that God allows them to do. I mean, God technically even told David that, hey, you know, if you'd asked me, I'd have gave you a woman. You know, and here he was killing the wife of Uriah. And he gets away with it, technically. I mean, hey, murder, let's get real. David got away with a big one. Dare I say more about that? I could, but what we're talking about is not just the fact that God had mercy upon David, but that God uses and chooses whom he uses. doesn't matter when and where and why and how and if and but and everything else that we like to do on our side with theology. What God does on his side is he uses whom he chooses. That's it. So I, I don't fault people that are in charge or wherever they've gone, but what I do hold to a higher standard that even Romaine taught me was that I don't tolerate this stupidity that sometimes is promoted by posting on the internet or stating it in some false teaching. If somebody's out there teaching false, I won't fault the person, but I will say the teaching is false. I will go after it, you know, 100% from the scripture and from the spirit of God that's within me. Because not only will I go after it, but I'll learn from it, I'll teach about it, I'll show where the error came from, I'll show where the flesh came from, I'll show you where the history, the historical background of it is, what it's accomplishing, what it's doing, and why it is, and then why God might allow it. Put it bluntly, because God allows people to go off on error, believe it or not. I've seen a lot of Calvary chapels that go way off on tangents and fail and quit being Calvaries. And the pastor quit being a pastor. I've seen a lot of them. Not as many as are started, but a lot. And in my day, in my time, you know, they came and they went, you know, and it was like Romain used to say, you open the doors, the wind blows, and there they go. You know, and they last for maybe a year or two, maybe maximum five. And if they last five years, hey, they're going to keep going, probably. Recently, I saw a lot of them fail over political suicide. You know, it's when a church gets into political arena, they commit spiritual suicide. But my point of it being is this. I never got a chance to go to the Calvary Bible Colleges because God said, no, I will show you, I will teach you. Much like Paul, I will teach you my doctrine. And so, wow, I said, okay, Lord, and to whom much is given, much is required. And I was given a blessing in disguise that's a thorn in the flesh in reality that also has almost killed me most of my life because I was taught of God. And that was Crohn's disease. I've been down to, I've mentioned this lots of times in my testimonies, but, you know, I went down to 89 pounds, four, five, six, seven, you know, at least ten times in my life, you know, 
and looked like those guys that you would see the skeletons, you know, in the Shoah, in the Holocaust. You know, it was like, yeah, I remember, you know, where I could wrap my hand around my neck, you know, and you don't think you can until you've been there. Then you go, whoa. And that's how I used to, people used to catch me doing that. I'd go, wow, you know, and then I'd, I'd go like that around my legs, you know, and, you know, now that I can, let's see if I can do it. I don't even know if I can do it with two hands. Wow! Two hands, and I could barely get, you know, there's only about that much gap around my legs. But that was because, in my mindset, I was a physically debilitated Crohn's disease patient that was dying from a disease that God said, No, you will not die, but you shall declare my works and my testimonies. And so, these 40 years later, God did it all my life. Whether I was in sin or in righteousness, whether I was in the church or Baxson, whether I was in Mexico, Israel, Alaska, or wherever it was that I went, God still used me no matter what. And God used me, and that confused me because of the great love that he had for me. And what I wanted to bring out about all this was that he prepared me for today to bring about one of the greatest things that I've ever seen in my life that blessed me today. And that was I finished today posting, oh, I guess it's about 2.30 in Mountain Time in Utah. The third day, this is the third day of us doing the School of the Bible. And we started off with this idea that God spoke to me and said, you know, you start a school. Because I didn't like what was happening recently in the local churches. I saw what the local church offered for classes, and I said, ew, you're charging? You know, and they have one class, they're charging $50 to get into Fifty bucks? Oh, it's not to get into, by the way. It's to get the materials. Excuse me, for fifty dollars, you know, I could start a church. Yeah. So, you know, they're into this money making, you know, money laundering, money rafting, money, 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 honey. You know, <laughs> money, 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 money. You know, this kind of Donald Trump thing, you know, where you get these speakers to come in and you buy their wares because that's how they make their money. You know, they're going to make profit off of selling you junk that, after all, you know, what are you going to do with it, really? I mean, videos, tapes, books, you know how cheap you can make those? You can do them free. I mean, that's what I do with Video Ministry. It's all free. Same thing with Video Church. It's all free. It was provided for by God. Now, it means that, you know, I have to do a little bit of fast shuffling in a way, you know, that I don't pay any taxes. I don't have to do anything. I don't get involved in the government. I don't do all these other things. But the building is there. The Outdoors is there. Everything's there to provide it for that I can minister that with which God administers to me. And then we share it around, around the world on the Internet. Doesn't cost a cent. Doesn't cost a dime. And that's what brought us to School of the Bible. We wanted to start the university, or the Bible Teaching University, and we wanted to start the Community Bible College, and we wanted to start School of the Bible. Three things I laid before the Lord in. We stopped what we were doing in doing our daily ministry where we were promoting um, the video ministries to a degree that we were doing a video, probably four or five videos a day. And so we backed off that for a while and said, okay, Lord, you know, education is important. Let's get the best classes possible and put them all together and present them so that people could study and learn and know of you. Because that really is what education should be. It should be a knowledge of a growing in the personal relationship that you have with Jesus. You should have tools and make yourself available to them that the Spirit of God could bring into your life a fullness of the wonder of knowing God in an intimate and personal way. That He can lead you in the way that you need to go. And here in Utah, God began to show me that that meant that, hey, a Mormon could stay in the Mormon church. A Jehovah's Witness might stay in the Jehovah's Witness church. Calvaries might stay Calvaries. Vineyards might stay Vineyards. Catholics might stay Catholics and Protestants might stay Protestants because... There's not a whole lot of time left, and Jesus is coming soon. But not only that, there's a reason why they're there. If you don't put salt in something, it putrefies. There may be a reason why you're in some place, doing something where you're at. That's why we provide this. Video Church providing for the knowledge that God can better direct you than man can do what he wants to do with you. In other words, whatsoever it is the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. For as we said in 1 John, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. God may send you to Africa or Timbuktu or Russia or Herzegovina or any place in the world, and you may get involved temporarily in some things, but inside is what the difference is. 
Your relationship will always be where God abides, and God abides in you. It is no longer, as we're told as Christians, I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. The life that I now live, I live by the will of the Son of God, who died for me and gave himself for me. That means that he is in me, and he is in you, and what he do with you is up to you and him. And what he do with me is up to me and him. And if we come together and it be that God wants us to be three, him and you and me, then we have oneness and fellowship one with another. But if God wants you to go somewhere, then go there. And that's the point. And that's why we have the education department of Vidigo Church. That's why we started School of the Bible. To provide all venues, that avenue of education, that would be so powerful and so right on that I would sit back and look at it and go, wow, 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 like I did today. And I looked at the material and I've read everything every day as I post them and watch them and whatever. And I just had to think, you know, I wish I would have had this when I was growing up. You know, I mean, as a baby. I mean, really, all of this, you know, school of the Bible. I mean... I'm glad for the experience that I had in taking kind of like a Solomon's way of learning wisdom and knowledge. You know, God used it now, you know, but it, it, it was painful along the way. There was a price to pay for what I know today. And it's tough. It's rough. It hurts. You know, people think that it's easy to just tell someone false or look at a pastor and say, you know what, dude, you know, you just, you're losing it. You know, you're going to have to pick up pieces behind you because you're, you know, you're, you're leaving a bloody trail behind you of people's lives and souls and emotions. But, hey, sometimes that's the way ministries work. They don't care what's the 99, or they care about the 99. They don't care about the one that's left behind. And the one that's left behind usually isn't one, but a hundred, you know. So, really, you know, it's kind of sad sometimes where we're at in Christendom today. That's why I read a lot of Tozer, or why we have a lot of, in School of the Bible, other ministries that are involved in allowing God's Spirit to touch your heart, to bring you to where I'm at today, to bring you beyond me where God is at so that He could give you His heart, so that you could begin to see people as needing and requiring an education that God can give them so that we don't have to say and look at each other, God, forgive them for they know not what they do, but that you could realize that you've blown it and you know what you did, and you could just simply be honest before God and say, yeah, I did it. I blew it. I'm at fault. Or, yeah, this isn't in the Bible. It's my personal project, my pet project. I know a pastor that's got this, you know, Jesus underwear, you know, museum. You know, and I'm like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? And I spent half a, you know, I don't know, about a week probably arguing with him on the Internet, you know, debating. And he told me, well, I spent my life, you know, investigating this, and it's all true. And I went, well... Okay, you know, and I had to let it go because it's like, well, if he spent his life investigating and God didn't tell him how false it is, what good is it going to do for me to try to tell him? God's the one who reveals it to him, so I know it's not Jesus' underwear. I'm sorry, the Shroud of Turin, there were 30 shrouds that were presented at the time that the Shroud of Turin was. They were all rejected. Then later, 10 years, or what is it, 3 years later, it's, project, it's brought up again. And then they go, well, we'll keep it around, you know, and they never treated it as being Jesus' underwear or Jesus' robe or however you want to look at it. I mean, even the book, The Robe, you know, is about technically Jesus, you know, it's the outer garment, but still, same idea as having Jesus' underwear around. No sign would be given except the sign of Jonah, so, you know, just don't go there with some of these things. But because of that, you know, I mean, that's a personal project that the guy put in the church, and I, I just had to go, Lord, you know, that's, that's obscene. You know, and God said, well, yeah, it is for you. You know, he likes it, so he needs it. Whatever he needs, if that's a crutch for him, hey, let him have holy underwear. Okay! In a state with holy underwear, you know, and I know what holy underwear is. I mean, the Mormons have holy underwear. The Jews have holy underwear. You don't know this, but Jews have holy underwear. We call them the um, Talis Katan. It's a, it's, a, it's a vest, technically. It goes over you. You know, it's kind of a white vest. It's real short. It's kind of like a... You wear it like over an undershirt, or sometimes wear it under the undershirt, but it's not, because it's kind of silky, you don't want to really do that. So you wear it over an undershirt, and it's got um, tallies on it, you know, little stringy thingies that, you know, are tied in certain knots, you know, you can tie them a certain way, and then you tie them in three, and then seven, and then three, and, you know, you tie them in a knot. That's kind of like knotted, you know, theology, you know, it's kind of like knotted up, you know, and you, that's why they're all bound up, because they got tallies katans, but 
Anyways, as a Jew, I know what a Tali's Katana is. So, hey, I understand the Mormons having holy underwear. I understand, you know, this Calvary pastor having Jesus' holy underwear or wanting to have holy underwear. Maybe he wears holy underwear. I don't know. But in a state that has holy underwear, holy moly, Batman, I think they've gotten carried away. As I call myself Boy Wonder. No, I'm kidding. But my point being is that, okay, fine, that's his shtick, you know, and God knows I don't want it, you know, and they do other things that I'm sure are wonderful, but I just can't go there, you know, it's like, I'm afraid if I started walking by the Museum of Holy Underwear, I'd start laughing, you know, and then they would take it offensive, and they probably have excommunicated me anyways. But, oh well, praise the Lord, there's other Calvaries too that are in this state. But... Not just Calvary chapels, but everybody's got their own little thing, you know, AOG or Vineyards or whoever it may be. But what I wanted to do with the school of the Bible was just to say, hey, let's just go for it, God. Let's say throw something out there that'll stick to the wall that people will go for and be able to have any time, anywhere, place, any time that they want to learn and to do. And so we built the websites. We built the, the blogger sites. We built the things all together. And then the first day... Almost 30, about 28 of them we posted. And it was like God said that night when I prayed about it, I was really exhausted. It was like, well, this is going to like overwhelm you. So then he cut back on some. Then he showed me what he wanted, the school of the Bible. Today, we did school of the Bible. Today, if you get a chance, then, you know, go to Facebook. You know, that's probably where you'll find it. You know, and go look for Video Church. You know, I mean, that's where we post first and then go out from there. Only because it's one of those funnel kind of things people appreciate going through a church rather than, you know, just coming out of left field or right field or from the sky or, you know, really from where it comes from, the Spirit of God. But going through video church from Facebook, you can find it, you know, just quote unquote Google video or video church, you know, and or Google Facebook, you know, Michael, James Stone or Google um, School of the Bible and you'll find it, you know, it's there I and mean, it's all over the place, really. Well, anyways, today we, we finished the course. We ran the race. I've done something that, in my life, I can look back and say, milestone. I mean, when I first, uh, when I first worked in the Calvary Chapel Tube Blending Library with that Maddie and Eileen, you know, I, it was a milestone. You know, it was a way marker. It was a Ebenezer, you know, an Ebenezer. It was a stone of remembrance. It was a place that I could look back and say, Bingo, up until this point, you know, I walked in the Spirit, talked in the Spirit, prophesied, laid hands, did healings, did things that were so well, you just can't do those things, you know, you just you, could, you couldn't live in this world to do that. You'd be Enoch, God would take you home. And, and it was wonderful. It, it was. It was powerful in the spirit, you know, things that the spirit of God did in those days, the way he used me. And so I look back on that, you know, that was an Ebenezer, you know, or then when I died, literally, in Long Beach Balboa Naval Hospital, or the time that I tried to commit suicide in Balboa Naval Hospital down in San Diego, and then the time that I looked in the mirror in Balboa, or in uh, Long Beach uh, Veterans Hospital, between the... the Paraplegic ward in the gym and then North Nine, as far as that, North Nine Irregulars. But um, I looked in the mirror at night, you know, and I saw my eyes and the joy of the Lord was gone. All the peace, the love, the joy, and there was a deadness there that you can often see in dead men or dead men or murderers or people that have died inside. And that was a Ebenezer, a marker, milestone. And I remember recovering from that. I wrote a book called Exposition of a Human Being. It took a lot for me to grow from that. And don't get me wrong, I mean, at the time, I had my Bible, I had my strong concordance, I was studying, I was learning, I was growing, you know, there were people that were being used that weren't Christians sharing Christian things, which was amazing, or sharing things like from Khalil Gibran, who's a Christian, you know, kind of out there Christian, but, you know, he was a Christian. He wrote about Jesus. So, in my life, experiencing these things, I began to realize that, you know, education was an important part. So, I always wanted to be more fit in rather than be on the outside because I always knew and understood because of what God had used in my life that I wouldn't quite fit because eventually I had surgery and then I was given an ostomy and with an ostomy there was a lot of adjustment and then the ileostomy permanent bag on my side 
So it was a lot of adjustment where I wouldn't be normal. I wouldn't be like other people. I wouldn't be able to be the same. You know, I'd be in a service or something, a prayer meeting, you know, and suddenly there'd be this huge gaseous explosions where it sounds like people, you know, flagellating, meaning that they pass gas, only mine wouldn't smell because it'd be in my bag, you know, so, you know, but it would be so humiliating for a young man, so embarrassing, so absolutely, you know, just devastating that I couldn't deal with it. So it was my issue that God brought me away from that and kept me separate, you know, for his purpose and for his design, much like he did with Moses when he took him into the desert in the wilderness for 40 years. So I spent a lot of time, you know, in different ministries growing and people learning of me and I learning of them and God using them and education in the practical things that I already learned in the reality of my Bible studies. And I learned through those experiences, you know, like little touchstones to mark off on my my bucket list, things that I've done, you know, like working in sound and again and again and again and again, or having a pastor come right out of a church ministry, a big ministry, and watch him start his first church, and then watch him grow that church up and then go through his first major division and watch him blow it. <laughs> well, he blew, you know, blew it, but what the heck. You know, and then the church division, and then the two churches succeed, and then one church fail, and then the other church grow, and then it divide, and then it become two churches, and both churches succeed, and then the pastor go on and do other things, you know, and weird, you know, to watch a pastor go through a full ministry, you know, and to be a part of that, you know, it was fascinating, or then to be a part of a community church that was very community-oriented, wasn't good on theology often, but was very intimate in the way that what a pastor should be that I've never seen a Calvary ever do. And I was amazed at that kind of intimacy that a, a church could have, a community church, a small one that would have membership. And then I remember that was a touchstone. And I remember little touchstones in my life that I could say, that is my memorial unto God. God did this. And I saw it and I bear witness with my life. I will teach of it. I will share of it. And God used it and explained it to me as I went through it afterwards. And like Likewise, when I went into my, my Jewish heritage, because I was raised as nothing, and when I explored that through Chabad, you know, working as a, a secretary to a Jewish Orthodox rabbi, to be the rabbi secretary is one thing, but to be a Jewish Orthodox Chabad rabbi secretary, oy, and the man who actually was the uh, biographer for Menachem Schneer, for Rebbe Menachem Schneerson, Whoa, that was interesting. You know, the Frozen Chosen has nothing on us. We were up in Alaska, you know, and it was like, wow, strange. Clicked off, you know, been there, done that. And that's what an Ebenezer is, life memorials that we see. And God used it because there were Christians, and he was using Christian music, changing the words to teach Jewish children different, like the Aleph Bet, you know, and he'd go like, Aleph Bet, Aleph Bet. Alephet, Alephet, you know, hallelujah, you know. I mean, in other words, this guy had an experience somewhere with Calvary chapels because he knew a lot of the Calvary songs and he would always try to provoke me into saying something. I never said anything to him. There were other Christian Jews there that I just didn't say anything because I knew it would expose them too. So, you know, that time that was what God wanted me to do. Another milestone. Then I remember living in Israel, you know, and being there as a missionary. Wow! <laughs> And I thought, you know, that, you know, when God spoke to me and said, you were going to Israel to die, I died. Boy, I died to all my misconceptions. I died to all my perceptions. I died to everything that I ever thought was true. Believe me, it changed everything once I had lived in Israel for 14 months. I mean, you could go there for a short period of time. You could go there for a visit. You could go there for a Bible study. You could go back year after year. But until you live there, you ain't been there. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, boy. It was, I lived in Rahavia. I just had my camera kick off. Oh, well, I guess it wasn't charged. So I lost one video, and we'll probably make two pieces out of it. But sticking with the other camera, because I have two cameras recording, I lived in Rahavia, Jerusalem. And that's a kind of a art, artsy kind of community. It was right around the corner from the uh, Jewish Reform. Conservative Reform. I think it was Reform Synagogue. It's the only one there, the only reform, or only conserv only reform, yeah, reform, had to be reform. So anyways, point being is that, you know, they were radical, you know, so the community was where the artsy used to live, but, you know, now it's just kind of like a nice community. So I lived in Rehavia, Jerusalem, and lived there all the times that I was there. But we went out at night, we'd sneak out into Meishrim and pass out tracks, you know, and do all kinds of crazy things, you know, me and 
and a few others that we called the, you know, the dynamic trio, you know. <laughs> there was, uh, I can't even think of, oh, Dove, and Miriam, Miriam, and um, uh, Spiros, from, he was a New York Jew, and I was from, you know, L.A., so it's kind of like interesting, and Miriam had migrated, you know, she was in Israel. You know, so there was Miriam and Spiros and, and me, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, we were the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, moving into Mayor Shreem and witnessing to Jews there. <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> it's a very, very ultra-Orthodox community. We'd have got killed. And eventually they did come and Mir stoned Miriam's house and they threw rocks, you know, through. And fortunately I wasn't in bed at the time, but the rock came through the window and hit the bed right where I would have been sleeping. Interesting. Big rock. <laughs> hmm. But anyway, it was wonderful. It was an interesting experience. And, you know, I watched all the turmoils and interesting things that go through at Calvary Chapel, Jerusalem at the time with Miriam and with Mariana and Bradley Antolovich that was sent out way back when. You know. So it was kind of a touchstone. But what I wanted to come to the conclusion of right now is to say, today, on this day, in 2015, in Utah, in a place where... You know, I share things that I know that are important to Mormons, that are important to all the Utahns that live here. It's not about the place you're at. It's the place you're going that God is developing you and taking you to. It's a relationship with Jesus that you have to have as a foundation in anything you do. Whether you stay in your church, whether you stay in your religion, whether you don't, or whether you decide that you're going to have no religion, the most important thing that you do have is Jesus. Because without Jesus, you can't get into the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter into heaven itself, and you can't approach the Father. And I don't care how you come to the place today to be listening to this. You've come to a place where we're talking about the school of the Bible. We're talking about something I'm proud of in my life to have been a part of. This is my crowning achievement of my life in 40 years of education to present to you something you can learn from. This school of the Bible that you should take with you anywhere you go, any place you go, and check it out and learn from it. All these materials that are presented are so dynamic. They're going to give you pieces and puzzle parts that are going to put them all together. You're going to learn so much that will blow your mind. Don't settle for a little bit of knowledge. Go after all that God has for you. Don't settle for, you know, like, well, you know, we're going to go to our little class, you know, pay some money. Take it free. Take it with you. Go where you want to be. You know, if you want to sit on a couch and watch it on your phone, iPhone, or your cell phone, or your little watch even that can do it, then do it. Or on a computer, or wherever. We designed it that way for you. To be able to be blessed that you could encourage yourself and be encouraged in the Lord as the Lord, my God, has raised up School of the Bible to minister to you in such a way that I can look at it today. As we finished all the classes and posted them, I went, Wow, I finished the course. I've run the race. There's laid up for me a crown of victory. I have achieved a victory. Another touchstone. Another cross off on my bucket list. Now, maybe we'll keep going every day. You know, maybe, maybe there will be a tomorrow. And I'm sure there will for me. <laughs> maybe not you. Who knows? But, you know, I'm sure I'm going to be around for a little while. I don't see the rapture happening this year, maybe next year, but not this year, 2014, this 2015. But, hey, you know, you get hit by a car, and that's a rapture for you. Something could happen, you die, you know, that's a rapture. But the point of it is this. Today was accomplished. Now, what we do now is gravy. It's just like, wow, praise the Lord. This is just, this is just sailing. It's like, wow, we did it. We, we, we finished the work. We missed, we hit the mark. We've accomplished the work that God intended. Now we're just giving it, you know, all out for what God wants to do with, if he wants more of it and the rest of it, and it'll be wonderful. But I just wanted to share that with you, that you should have milestones. You should have memories. You should have places where you can say, I did it. I accomplished the work. I reached the goal. I attained the prize. I have accomplished that with which God wanted me to do. I grabbed the brass ring and I won. Not the brass ring in the world. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of teachings out there that are false and a lot of churches that are going to give you some little certificate or some, you know, PhD, THD, and all these other foolish things. But for me, you know, just like how Paul felt about you're my pride and joy when it came to some of the churches that he wrote to after he was imprisoned, I can say today, 
looking at School of the Bible as we posted it today on February 2nd, 3rd, 4th. February 4th, that's what today is. February 4th, 2015. Race of work. I finished the work. I ran the race. There's laid up for me a crown of rejoicing. And I look forward to just being blessed by what you're going to learn from the School of the Bible as you give him the rest of your life. And I learn from you the rest of your story as we see what the rest of his story is with my life.